Hello everyone, this is Latia for you coming today with another scripture from the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray and we can get started. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for watching over us every day and keeping us. And even when we're not being faithful to you, Lord God, thank you for being faithful to us. Your scriptures reveal to us that your faithfulness is not like us. Lord God, your faithfulness and your steadfastness and your unchanging ability is nothing like the way we treat you, Lord. Forgive us for our sins and help us to be faithful to you. Help us to have faithful hearts and faithful minds and not fall back into our old ways, Lord. We give you glory, honor, and praise. Let your spirit be in this teaching and touch your servants. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, you guys. So we are in Isaiah 63 again today. We did um, verse four from Isaiah 63 yesterday, but the Lord wants us to do two different sections. So the first part was um, the day of vengeance of the Lord, right? And and we're going to do three verses from there. And it's going to seem like we're skipping a verse, but we're just going to the next section. And then he wants us to do verse um, seven through nine. So three through five and then seven through nine today. So let's go ahead and get started with verse three. And this is also from the teaching of um, bad bad fruit and I will link it at the very end of the teaching so let's just go ahead and get started um, Isaiah 63 verse 3 I have trodden the wine press alone and from the peoples no one was with me I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. So as we've read this before, this is the Lord's cry out to the people. Remember, the, the prophet is seeing a vision of the Lord coming back with his garments stained um, as if he's been trotting the wine press. But we know that the wine press and, and the activity of crushing grapes is not something that you are supposed to do alone. It's a communal activity. It's something that people come together and, and perform themselves all together. And so in this vision, for some reason, he's seeing the spirit of the Lord or the Lord coming towards him with stained garments, right? With, with blood stained garments. It, when you have these garments that have been treading the wine press, they look as if they have blood all over them, right? Because they are um, grapes. So, but this is basically where we get the thought also of the grapes of wrath, right? So he is actually treading this wine press, but this is symbolic of the fact of men that he's going to tread in his wrath and not just the treading of the grapes um, and of the men, but the fact that the ones who are supposed to be faithful to him are not helping him. The ones who are supposed to be um, going after him and, and, and doing his work and being in his harvest and being a part of, of this pressing, right, and, and the work that needs to be done they were not with him, right? He says, I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained my apparel, right? So, and we know this is a foreshadowing of Jesus, right? Um, uh, God in flesh is Jesus, right? So this is long before Jesus was born. That's how we, these are all foreshadowings of him, but, you know, he was slain before the foundation of the world. So we know he was there. We know his spirit was there. We know that he was present. 
and Isaiah actually got a glimpse of him in this vision with these spattered garments, right? And so we also know that, you know, when Jesus comes, his robe will be dipped in blood. And, and this is talking about the lifeblood, the grapes, the, the wrath, um, and the spattering of the lifeblood on his apparel. All right. So it says, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and the, and my year of redemption had come. So this is the verse that we had had yesterday that God really wanted us to emphasize along with a previous verse in Isaiah 62. So it says, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption had come. And this is, as we know, foreshadowing of rapture, because whenever you're talking about vengeance and you're talking about redemption and they're occurring at the same time and, and who's doing it, Jesus is doing it right? We're, we're talking about foreshadowing of rapture. So here he's saying that all this vengeance is being poured out on these grapes, this pressure, this pressing, this, this, you know, staining, you know, and, and spattering on his garments. It's all occurring at the same time as a redemption year, right? It's occurring at the, this vengeance is occurring at the same time that, that some are being taken away. And yet those some that are being taken away are not necessarily doing all the right things, right? And it, it shows more of a faithfulness of God than a faithfulness of man. It shows more about his character than about our character, right? Because he's still being faithful to them because this is still the year of redemption. This is still a year of his taking away those who are supposed to be faithful and his his treading down on those who have not been faithful those who need to be trod in his anger and trampled in his anger but it says i'm just going to skip back up to verse three again and from the peoples no one was with me and who are these peoples that those are his people right? His prophets, his apostles, his children, those who have accepted him, those who have called themselves to be faithful to him, they're not doing the work, right? They're not getting in there and getting dirty with him. They are leaving him to do the work alone. And so, yeah, that's pretty, pretty sad. So, okay, we're going to go to verse five. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. Wow. So he had to basically help himself is what he's saying. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled. I mean, this, this moved God's heart, not the fact of having to do it, but the fact that no one was there to help him. Those who he had redeemed were not faithful enough to come in and do and get the work done, right? It, a lot of times we're all about the words, we're all about saying, but just when it comes down to the doing, you know, sometimes we're caught up in our own sin, we're caught up in our own unfaithfulness, our selfishness, and yet God is still faithful, right? He depended on his own arm to bring him salvation, and his wrath is what upheld him, right? When, when people who are treading the wine press, the reason why it's such a communal activity, number one, it takes a lot of squashing and movement, but also you need people to lean on, right? This is not stable ground you're, you're treading upon. This is a bumpy, squishy surface, and you can slip, you can fall, you can hurt yourself, you can, you know, this is, this is a, a dirty job, right? So they hold on to one another and they, they stomp around on the grapes. And if someone stumbles, you try to help them. But here there was no one to help. It says, verse five, I look, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. No one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. Wow. His own arm had to be his strength. God had to hold him up, right? So that he could, he could go forth his own arm, 
brought him salvation and my wrath upheld me. Wow. Let's hope that this same arm will bring us salvation, will have mercy upon us. And that's where we get into in the next section, which is talking about his mercy, right? This is the day of his vengeance, right? The day of, of him um, raining down on the wrath of the unfaithful, those who chose not to trust in him, right? But then also the redemption of the peoples, the same peoples who would not help him. Right, so my own arm brought me salvation and my wrath upheld me. Verse seven, so this is now into the next section. We didn't read verse six. You can go back and read that if you like, but this is what the Lord said. So verse seven, eight, and nine. So this is in the, the section of his mercy, right? Okay, so it says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love wow that's a lot and and you can consistently see the word steadfast his consistency he's always headed in the same direction he's unchanging he's always willing to help he's always in a mode that is for his people and a mode of love right i will recount the steadfast love of the lord the praises of the lord the least that we can do is recount the praises of the lord it, especially in how unfaithful we can be right sometimes we just get caught up in our lives and we feel like just we have to get through that moment and in that moment can be engulfed in sin and we just have we're going to just do what we want to do right now and you know we'll we'll make up for it later we've all been guilty of this right but but here it's saying i will recount the steadfast love of the lord the praises of the lord the praises of the lord meaning that it, it wasn't dependent on whether or not we were being faithful it was his steadfastness sometimes we need to recount the praises of the lord take time get a piece of paper and just from 2022 recount the steadfast love of the lord recount the praises of the lord the things that he has been faithful to you in right write down some things what has god brought you through right? How many times has he saved you? How many times has he helped you not get into that car accident, not fall asleep while you were driving, not get fired or get fired and then find another job, right? Or, or be pushed into a corner on your job and somehow he got you out of it when it looked like there was no other way and, and God was not going to come through. He somehow made it happen, Right, I can recount just myself alone, just in my particular circumstance, you know, his faithfulness. And though the affliction came, right, though the, the things that I didn't want to have to deal with, though they came, they, they came anyway, regardless of whether I was doing good or I was doing bad, they still came. But the, the thing is, his steadfastness of his love, he somehow got me out of it. He, he somehow, even when it seemed like the enemy was winning, dealing with specific people in my daily life, it felt like the enemy was going to win, right? But God shown himself to be so faithful that sound it feels just like the mask of even that we study where he all he could see was the situation around him right he, he talked about how God had not been faithful how th this didn't look good for David that how how this was gonna fail and Lord you said these things but you have not held fast to your covenant with David and yet we know that David's throne never failed we know that his enemies never actually succeeded against him, right? 
So it says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord. We have to remember that we can't see the whole story. We can't see the end from the beginning. All we know is what we know. All we know is that God is going to be faithful to us. Why? Because he is steadfast in his love. He is steadfast in in his faithfulness towards his children. I thought for sure, like in, in my specific circumstance, it was with school and dealing with a specific person that somehow I was going to end up just having to repeat a semester or do something like it, it just was it was that bad and it was to the point of you know I was just so stressed right and of course I was pregnant and and having to you know just do everything and then I was commuting for like an hour and something each way so basically two and a half to three hours every day and then this person you know I just felt so backed into a corner constantly I could do nothing right and it was just really hard right you know and then leaning so heavily on my husband because I had my girls here and somehow God provided help. God got me through it, right? I'm I'm gonna be honest. Like I I went through graduation and and did the ceremony, but I was too scared to go back and look at my grades. I was too scared that I was gonna have to repeat a class. I just recently, a couple weeks ago, went back to just look to make sure that I had actually graduated, <laughs> just to be sure you know, that, that everything had gone through, that's how tough the semester was, but not only did God see me through, and get me through it, and make it happen, right, he somehow, some way, made my grades really great, and I'm like, there's no, what, (laughs) you know, I was just completely baffled at how God was so steadfast in his love, I, I felt like the masculine Ethan, truly. Like I felt that sense of God, you know, I, I don't know why I feel like this is this is just, you know, I'm being cons- constantly attacked, constantly, you know, come against. And why is it that I don't receive the full love right now? Why is it that I'm being so, you know, under a, such a strict attack? You know, are you still for me, Lord? You know how you get in these circumstances and you wonder, is God still for me? Yes, he's still for you. He is steadfast in his love, right? We need to recount the praises of the Lord. We need to recount how many times he has shown himself to be faithful. He has shown himself to be true. And he got you out of that last circumstance. And he's going to get you out of it. He will be faithful to do it again and again. Why? Because you're his child. And even when you won't tread the wine press with him, he will withhold his vengeance still from you. Why? Because you are his people. You are his child. You are the one that he has set his love upon right? And he will be faithful, even if the circumstance does not look faithful. He never said that these afflictions wouldn't come. He never said that that you wouldn't go through anything. Remember what we, what we learned in the previous section, that it, hey, it, it's going to be affliction, right? It, it's it's going to happen, but at least it's not going to be the refining of silver, right? You're not going to be in there seven times. That to me is such an affirmation of the fact that Christ is going to redeem us. He's not going to let us go through that silver refinement process, right? He's going to, he's going to pull us out before that. Yes, we will have affliction, but we're not going to have tribulation, right? That, that seven time burning, right? That, that going through it over and over again, right? I mean, if you look at that, that to me, if that doesn't look like the seven years of tribulation versus just going through regular trials, he's saying that there's a difference. He's saying that there's going to be something that divides the two, right? So let's just keep reading. According to all the Lord has granted us, 
and the great goodness of the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Wow, he is letting you know that this is this is not a, a standard compassion. This is something of abundance, right? Remember when we see, let's just go back up to the first part. According to all the Lord has granted us and what, what has he granted us? Let's go back before that. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that he has granted us. So that is for you. That is a note for you, a nugget to, hey, this is going to help me if I sit and recall the things that he's done for me. Sit down sometimes, write down some of the faithfulness of God. If God did something for you today, go put it in a diary. Just, just get yourself a book, go to Ross, get a book and just write down when good things happen that kind of surprised you. Carry it around with you, carry it in your purse and try to sit down and make notes throughout the day, right? You don't even have to do it every single day, just for a week right? Just just do it for a week and, and see how much God has blessed you. Try to recount of this year the greatest things that God has done for you, right? He has been a great love of your life. He has carried you. You are his child, right? Remember his goodness. Remember the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord. And if you are bombarded, if you are oppressed, if you are in a state of agony, just recount waking up, right? If, if you can't, if you if the devil has clouded you and made you feel like, well, there's nothing for me that, that I can think of, just think of the fact that you have breath in your body right now. Just think of the fact that you can listen to encouragement. Just think of the fact that that God is with you and he felt enough for you to be able to hear a word of encouragement that will lift your countenance. Sing him praises. Remember his steadfast love according to all that the Lord has granted us. He has given us so much, so much mentally, physically, and spiritually. He has sustained you and the great goodness to all the house of Israel. So he's saying, don't just remember what he's done for you. Remember what he did for Israel. Remember what, and, and, and when you're remembering his goodness, his great goodness to the house of Israel, remember how unfaithful they have been to him as well, right? And yet he was so good. He was so full of compassion. He is so full of just love and steadfastness towards the house of Israel. How much more so for you under this greater covenant, which is Christ Jesus, right? He is, he is doing such a wonderful thing. He's doing it for you. He's doing for the house of Israel. Remember any promise in here that is of Israel, you can claim it for yourself, right? It's all according to your faith. Do you believe? Are you under the old covenant? Or are you under this new covenant? This new covenant is a greater covenant, right? This is for your own benefit. This is the good news, right? That you didn't have to die for your own sins, that he came and did it for you. Why? Because he loved you so much because of, it, it, because of his great goodness, right? It says, according to all the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion. It's not according to his wrath. It's not according to how good they were or, or the report card they had gotten that season in him, whether they had done more things for him or themselves, right? He was so full of compassion. It was according to his compassion that he granted him them all this great goodness, right? And the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love, which means that he is abounding in love. That means he, is, he has so much love. It is it's so great. It's so full, right? He, that's how he grants it according to the amount that he has, which means that it's perpetual. It is something that's ongoing. It's something that, that cannot be stopped. 
This is a God who created the universe. This is a God who created us knowing that we would be unfaithful to him. It is according to the abundance of his steadfast love. That's how he deals out his compassion. Wow. Let's read the whole verse together. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Verse eight, for he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. Wow. He was hoping that we would be faithful to him. He, he had hope for us, right? And yet he did not do what he did out of the fact, the mere fact that, hey, we would be faithful because otherwise he could have cut it off, right? And he knew that eventually we would be unfaithful. And it reveals that it later in Isaiah 63, and yet he still holds our hand. He still comes to us. He still forgives us. He's still steadfast in his love, right? He knows the future. He has hopes that we won't deal falsely. He has hopes that we're going to overcome. God, forgive us. Forgive us for being so unfaithful, even when you are faithful. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. When God becomes your savior, you are, you are enveloped in him, right? And therefore you can be faithful, right? He says, be perfect as I am perfect. How can you be perfect? Be found in him. His, his righteousness covers you. Remember his glory uh, is his glory. I think his glory goes before you and he'll be your rear guard or either that or the other way around. But either way, it says that surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. We know that he knows that we're going to deal falsely, right? But when he's our savior, that's how we can be faithful. Why? Because he has saved us. He has died for our sins. And therefore, we are not dealing falsely if we are found in him. It says, for he says, surely they are not, surely they are my people, children who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. Verse nine, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Wow. Look at his love. He was already foreshadowing his death on the cross here. He was already foreshadowing how he would have to go through the same trials and tribulations that we have all faced. He's faced all of them. He's gotten through them all. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, right? All that they went through, he had gone through. He, he dealt with it all and yet he was faithful and he didn't sin. That's how we can be faithful. That's how we can be children who are not false, right? It says in their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. The angel of his presence saved them. A lot of times you'll see the angel of God's presence or the angel of the Lord as um, a foreshadowing of Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And then also the angel of his presence can represent um, the portion of the Godhead that is the paraclete, which is the, um, the Holy Spirit. So he's saying that he was with them, right? And it says that in, the, in their affliction, he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. He came in and saved them in their affliction. He was there. He went through everything that they went through. Not one person, but everything that every person had gone through. He was with them. He was afflicted with them. When Jesus intercedes for you, don't think he's interceding from a place of not understanding. He's interceding having gone through what you've gone through. 
the brokenheartedness, the unfaithfulness of people, the, the, the loss, right? The rejection. God has been through that. Jesus has been through that. The angel of his presence has saved us. The Holy Spirit in our particular circumstance has saved us. He has been there with us. He has been a comfort. And yet Jesus has been through everything that we went through. He's not a God who can't relate to us. I don't know that exact scripture, but he, he's a God that relates. He's a God that, that knows what we've been through. It says in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. God has pity on you right? He, he, he's had pity on you. When you were out there in sin, when you were out there in need of a savior and you turned to him in his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He felt for you. He felt you in your affliction. He felt you in your loss and your rejection. So in his love and in his pity for us, He reached down and redeemed us. He redeemed them. Thank you, Lord. He's about to redeem us out of his love and out of his pity. pity. And also, Lord, thank you for your mercy. We hope in his mercy. Because there are so many reasons why he could say no. And yet he's such a faithful and steadfast God. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old it just reminds me of psalms 91 where it says he he'll he'll bear you up right he'll cause his angels to bear you up so you don't dash your foot against the stone it says he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old wow thank you lord for carrying us Thank you for remembering us, even when we were being unfaithful. Thank you for remembering the things that you've done for us, even though we can't even remember all the things that you've done for us. We've been out there doing whatever for so many years. Sometimes we can even think of, uh, we can't even think of the seasons and how rebellious we've been and how we could have lost our lives. It says, in his love and his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and he carried them all the days of old. Imagine when you were being unfaithful to God, he was carrying you on his shoulders. Just like a faithful father, you know, when you're walking somewhere and and you don't want to cut your foot on something and your father just lifts you up and puts you on his shoulders and carries you so you don't you don't cut your foot or hurt your foot while you're walking on a beach or something it says he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old god has carried you he is carrying you he will always carry you he is not saying that the 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 Brussels, the the things on the ground that might hurt your foot, the thorns and thistles, that they won't come. He's saying they will come. He's going to carry you. He's going to be afflicted where you're afflicted. And the presence, his presence will be with you, right? He's going to pity you and redeem you, right? He's going to go through those things with you and be with you. Thank you, Lord God, for your faithfulness. All right, you guys, this is where we'll end today. But let me go back just one verse so we can see the scripture of emphasis that he did want me to say. For he said, surely they are my people, children who did not, who will not deal falsely. And he became their savior. He knows when you're, when you're not going to deal falsely. He knows when you are going to deal falsely. But be found in him. Let him be your savior. Let him cover your sins. Blessed is he whose sins are not counted against them. Ask the Lord, Lord, don't let my sins be counted against me. Let me be found in you. Let me abide in your presence, Lord Jesus. Forgive me of my sins and help me to walk uprightly and you faithful the way you want me to. And not only that, help me to make sure I'm not letting you tread this wine press alone.
Help me to be a faithful worker, God. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, if you would like to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, or if you would just like to rededicate yourself to him, just pray this prayer with me. But more than saying the words, truly believe them with all your heart and you will be saved and you will be redeemed back to him and set back on the right track. All right. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. I have led myself for long enough. I'm asking you to lead me. Forgive me of my sins. Sit on the throne of my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again on the third day. I believe you are the Son of God the Messiah. Lord Jesus, if if I have received you before and I straight away, I'm sorry. Lead me back to you, God. Redeem me when you come. Help me to turn away from sin and turn back to you. Help me not to chasten your spirit. Lord God, help me to learn how to spend time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have received Christ in that prayer, or if you have turned back your heart to him and and want to walk in his ways, then you are a child of God. You are abiding in him now, and his presence is being poured in you. When the Holy Spirit comes into you, he seals you until the day of redemption. And that's the job of the Holy Spirit, to seal you up until the redemption of the the Redeemer. So the only person who can break that seal is Jesus alone. So he is going to keep you as long as you want to be kept. He is going to be there for you as long as you don't chasten his spirit away, right? So be with Christ, walk with Christ you know, ask forgiveness of sin zealously, you know, repent, because this is how we continue to abide. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to get into us and, and, and you know, stay there, ha- make a home there, talk to God, right? That's how you talk is through his Holy Spirit, inviting his presence in. The angels of the angel of his presence save them. I love that. I'm just looking at that. It's so beautiful. His presence is with you. He's gonna lead you and guide you into all truth. He's gonna tell you which church home to go to. He's gonna tell you where you can go and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And he's just gonna show you where you can go and be sharpened with other believers. That way you can stay sharp and know how to use his word, right? You need to know how to wield this sword of his word, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you can do that by being around other believers and learning and and being around them, being in their presence. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves one to another, right? He wants you to come together. So do what the Lord says and come together with his people and, you know, Go out and make disciples of all men. Go out and and tell others of his goodness. Tell others of how he saved you and how or how he has turned you back towards him. All right, you guys, I love you. I'm praying for you. I hope that God make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you his children his peace. And I am just knowing that the Lord has great things in store for you before his return and beyond. All right. If I don't see you next time, I'll see you in the clouds. Take care.